The views expressed on this program are those of the producers and individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sun Prairie Media Center staff, its video service providers, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Well, hello there, and welcome to Real Reviews. My name is Jameson Rabbit, and this week I'm joined by the friendly face you all know and you all love, it's Steve Sabaki. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. Please tell me that we're not going to talk about Cocaine Bear today. Not yet. Good. We don't talk about Cocaine Bear. There's two rules. <laughs> hey, the first rule is we don't talk about Cocaine Bear. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw the trailer, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to see this one. So Now, I saw that trailer a few weeks ago. I can't remember what movie I was at. Uh, but there was an older gentleman in the theater with me with his granddaughter, and he was openly rooting for that. Th <laughs> and then as we were walking out, the posters hanging in the wall of the palace, and as we we're leaving the theater, he points and he goes, finally, they're making movies for me. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess there's an audience for <laughs> it then. Always an audience for somebody. Uh, this week, though, we have uh, a few movies to talk about. We've got three movies that were on the marquee. we got a streaming film as well. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us started with the first one we have on the marquee. It's a film that I saw called The Amazing Maurice, uh, uh, directed by Toby Genkel and Florian Westerman. Uh, the Amazing Maurice is based on the novel The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents by uh, Terry Pratchett. Uh, Maurice is a talking cat that people can hear. Uh, he is voiced by Hugh Laurie. Uh, he's a con man who's teamed up with a group of talking rats, and they go town to town running a grift where Maurice alerts the townsfolk of a rat infestation and most likely plague associated with that. Uh, and then he whips up a hysteria and offers a solution to the townsfolk for a price. Uh, he knows of a human who can play a recorder that he calls a pipe uh, and lead the vermin out of town. And uh, Maurice is also running a con on the rats and Keith, the uh, human, uh, because he's pocketing the money that the townsfolk are paying. Um, and Keith, the human here, he's a, he's a bit bumbling, our Pied Piper. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's not all there. Uh, and the rats themselves all have this dream of finding the mythical island of Mr. Bunsey that they've all read about in books, a place where all the animals talk. And... Uh, they see it in a basically a Peter Rabbit ripoff style book, and they feel like this is real. And uh, Maurice tells them, "Oh yeah, I know exactly where that place is." But he's a con man; he doesn't know where it is. Um, so they roll into this town, and they they run into uh, another group of con men, some other rat catchers running a similar scam. There's a nefarious team of rat catchers who claim to have cleared the town of vermin. Uh, they're working for their mysterious boss, who looks mysteriously like a bunch of rats stacked on top of each other wearing a trench coat. Uh, uh, and they're fleecing the town of all their money, but the food in the town keeps going missing uh, because it's a big mystery. So Maurice and his gang, they run into a young lady, Melicia, who loves mystery novels, they f and she figures out their scam immediately and wants to be a part of it because she loves dramas and she loves she wants to be a part of a mystery. And so these... Two teams of rats and humans begin to foil each other, uh, and the film kind of starts spinning all these weird stories together, and we have a rat king with magical powers. Um, so there in the trailer, the actual Pied Piper shows up, and he's trying to put humans into ovens. What? Are, do kids all understand this? Not at all. I can't <laughs> imagine they do. And at one point, as the Pied Piper is like really getting into some dark stuff, he's like, remember... Fairy tales used to start with really dark origins. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is true. Um, yeah, you have rats pitted against vicious dogs, like a dog fighting ring where they're killing rats in the oh, rings. Oh, my. Um, yeah. It's, and then you have uh, one rat named Dangerous Beans, who's the spiritual <laughs> leader of the rat clan, who has to face his own mortality in battle. It's a lot. It's a lot. I don't know if you've ever read the book or seen no, the movie. No, I've never uh, heard of it. No, the uh, uh, the book uh, Watership Down. Uh, I've heard of that, yeah. yeah which was a, another, I remember seeing the animated movie that, A Bunch of Rabbits. Tragic. Killing Fields. It was dark. It was not a kid's movie. This reminded me of that in parts where I'm like, this is a lot for the kids that are in the audience with me right now. I can't imagine that they're 
understanding, enjoying. Well, uh, maybe some of them were probably horrified. By Absolutely. It. <laughs> There's rats being thrown into a pit and vicious dogs are going after them. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is dark. Wow. Um, it, it, you know, it also, in points, it spun really heavily into the, the mystical Terry Pratchett territory that I'm really familiar with, reading his novels and love that. Okay. I enjoy when we, when we got into that, but really, it felt pretty dark for the audience of kids that was there with me. Um, the animation is fine in it. It's nothing crazy, nothing special. Um, I don't know that this is a movie that the whole family will embrace. Doesn't sound like it. No, but I enjoyed it. I, I think it was fun. It was fun enough. It was definitely based more for an audience of me as opposed to an audience of eight-year-olds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so the, the amazing Maurice, I ended up giving three stars. It's good enough. Oh. But, you know, maybe not, don't put it on and set the toddler in front of it. <laughs> this, there might be some problems. Well, I, uh, there hasn't been a lot of publicity about this one. No, really not. I haven't seen any TV commercials about it. No, I don't think, no. it's a small studio, and I, yeah, I don't think they really put a budget out. Okay. So, there you go, the amazing Maurice. All right. All right, speaking of movies that are getting publicity, sir, what do you have for us? Well, since I'm closer to 80 than Jameson <laughs> is, uh, I'm going to talk about 80 for Brady. It's in theaters. It's directed by Kyle Marvin and produced by somebody you probably heard of, Tom Brady. Hmm. Uh, this film follows four lifelong friends who just love uh, Tom Brady. They get together every, every Sunday to watch him and his New England Patriots. And they are played by four well-known, well-respected veteran actresses. You've got Lou played by Lily Tomlin. She wants to go to the Super Bowl because she's afraid that her cancer will come back. Trish played by Jane Fonda. She writes erotic novels with Rob Gronkowski as the lead character. Uh, Maura, played by Rita Marino, who lives in a nursing home after the death of her husband, even though she has a home she can go back to. And Betty, played by Sally Field. Uh, she's a retired MIT professor, married to another professor, played by Bob Balaban, <laughs> who always looks the same. He, he, he never ages, and I love Bob Balaban, and uh, he's in this as well. So this is a film, that the story is that they want to go see Tom Brady in Super Bowl 51 in 2017. That was the Super Bowl where the Patriots came back and beat the Atlanta Falcons after a 28 to three deficit. Now this film will try to make you believe that these four women had something to do with that. <laughs> right. uh, but the, you know, the movie follows these four from getting together every week to watch the games, to trying to get tickets for the Super Bowl, to actually going to the Super Bowl and, of course, all the hijinks that occur once they get there. So, I mean, it's it's got everything. You want a dance number? You got it. Better believe it. Uh, how about a little romance? Throw in some Harry Hamlin. You got that, too. Uh, cameos? Yeah, there's plenty of them. Uh, Marshawn Lynch, Pat Oswalt, Billy Porter, Guy Fieri. Oh, just a lot of Guy name Fieri. A, yeah, a lot of, <laughs> too much Guy Fieri, just to name a few. And last but not least, how about putting in a plot twist that would never, ever, ever, ever <laughs> happen at a professional football game? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It but got a little wonky in that part. Yeah, it's in there too. <laughs> um, this film was inspired by a real-life group of uh, Patriot fans known as the Over 80 for Brady Club. And apparently how this all got started was the grandson of one of the uh, members of the club pitched the idea for a film. Oh, okay. All right. And by the way, I read where this club, unfortunately, never made it to a Super Bowl. Ooh, so, sad. But, uh, I mean, there's definitely an audience for this type of film. I, you know what, comedies for, uh, for this generation are really rare, I feel like. They comedies are. Comedies focused on, on that demographic are really rare. You see, I mean, just before that movie, I see trailers starring other actors of that same generation. They're all kind of dour, aging romance movies and facing mortality. And I thought this one was kind of modern in its comedy. It didn't, I, I, you know, I thought they were fun. And the, the actresses, I'm not a big fan of all of them. I'm not a big Lily Tomlin guy. I, don't mm -hmm. really, I, really, I enjoyed her. Um, I really enjoyed Rita Moreno. I've always loved Sally Field. Yeah, I thought Sally Field was actually the yeah, best I mean, out of the four. By far. Yeah, she was um, great. To me, one of the funny things about this is it felt to me like 
because Tom Brady has a heavy hand in this, he, this is his production, it felt like him sticking the knife into Matt Ryan, the Atlanta Falcons quarterback, <laughs> one last time. Because yeah. he has trolled Matt Ryan over the years with the 28-3. to three, the tw- And then mm-hmm. Matt Ryan this year had the biggest collapse in NFL history as quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts against the Vikings, blew a 33-point lead, loses his job, and then has to relive his most embarrassing moment of his lifetime on the big screen thanks to Tom Brady. It felt like Tom Brady just twisting a knife one more yeah, time before I, he left. I'm, my, I'm guessing Matt Ryan has not seen this and will not go to it. <laughs> Right. And then coinciding with Tom Brady's retirement. Now this is his retirement, like, mere days before yep. this movie opens up. Mm-hmm. All very convenient. Um, I, I enjoy it. And then I like that we throw in little jokes, like uh, Tom Brady can't find his jersey at the end of the movie. He wants to do a jersey swap with Lily Tomlin, and he can't <laughs> find it because in real life his jersey was stolen after that Super Bowl. Um, was it really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It was investigation. They found I his, didn't know that. One of the equipment guys stole his Super Bowl jersey. Um yeah, I like. I like I, it. I, I, All of them had little subplots. To yeah, I, I mean, it's got some flaws in it. I mean, oh, yeah. you got the the they go to the party and they accidentally take drugs. And There's <laughs> always has to be an accidental drug <laughs> yeah. scene in these movies. Um, what's interesting about this, and I, I guess it, it's done pretty well so far. Uh, of the opening weekend audience, forty seven percent were over the age of fifty five. Mm-hmm. 69% were women, and much of the sales came from matinee showtimes. Sure. I think, you know, I'm going to be turning 65. I thought I, I, thought I was probably one of the youngest persons <laughs> in the audience. And, you know, they showed a trailer for another one of these that's coming out in a few months with Jane Fonda, Diane Keaton, yes. yeah, Mary yeah. Steenburgen, and Candace Bergen. Candace Bergen, yeah. Another uh, book club uh, movie. Yep. So, I, I mean, yeah, there's... There's an audience out there that's looking for an hour and a half to two hours of entertainment without any violence or blood and gore or cursing or. I w- I went in with the lowest expectations for this movie, yeah. and I was entertained by it. I had some chuckles. I enjoyed I myself. I had a few. Yeah, not a I lot. Bad- I give me more Bob Balaban. I'm with you. Yeah, I mean, is this movie going to lead to more acting roles for Tom Brady? Oh, that's oh I hope not. I, hope not. <laughs> I really hope not. <laughs> no. No. Uh, all right, what did you end up giving 80 for Brady? Uh, I gave it two and a half stars. Um, I mean, stay tuned for the sequel, Codgers for Rogers. Oh, from your lips. As soon as he comes out of that dark <laughs> retreat, start shooting pitch ideas here. Uh, what did I give it? I think I gave it three stars. I, oh, okay. I think a lot of it is expectations. Yeah. You know? I, I was going yeah. back and forth between that score and two and a half. I had fun with it. I mean, they definitely looked like they were having fun. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, speaking of having a lot of fun, our last movie on the marquee this week is the newest film from director M. Night Shyamalan. It is Knock at the Cabin. Uh, it uh, features a young family who is away on a vacation at a remote cabin in the woods. Uh, their young daughter, Wen, played by Chris, Kristen Kui, is approached by an immense man who is trying to befriend her. He, he's creepy, he's... Strange but seemingly thoughtful, he's a large man named Leonard, played by Dave Bautista. Um, But soon this man, Leonard, is joined by three others who come out of the woods carrying homemade, kind of brutal-looking weapons. And uh, Wen runs into her house, and uh, it soon becomes a home invasion story, as parents Eric and Andrew, played by Jonathan Groff and Ben Aldridge, are faced with a nightmare scenario while trying to protect their young daughter. Uh, These four people who are standing on their porch and eventually break into this cabin are adamant to get inside. But it's strange because they're not angry or scary for the most part. They're threatening in their actions, but kind of contrition in their words. Um, And uh, Leonard, as the leader in this hulking presence, really seems reluctant to have to do what he has to do. And this whole group of four seemed kind of pained. Uh, by the way, we have um, uh, Leonard, we have Abby Quinn, who or plays Adrian. We have Nikki Amuka Bird, who plays Sabrina. And Rupert Grint, you know him as... Harry Potter uh, character. Uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot his name, though. Just blanked his name. <laughs> <laughs> he ends up with Hermione. Yeah, brother. his friend. Uh, yeah, his friend. he plays yeah. Redmond. Uh, we'll begin with others. Um, and... Uh, they, they stand before this family that they have tied up once they get inside, and they have uh, an offer to them, basically. The, 
they, they give their story about who they are and how they met, and then the ask comes, the hard sell comes, but they're not selling a timeshare. They're selling uh, an impossible ask, a Sophie's Choice scenario. Uh, each of these people has seen an apocalyptic vision, and they are convinced that the only way to stop the apocalypse is for one of these three people to decide to kill, choose who's going to die to stop the apocalypse. And... Uh, if they don't choose, horrible things are going to happen to the world, and they, these folks feel they can control the apocalypse, they can, if they can just convince someone in this family to make their choice soon. And uh, it becomes, you know, it's uh, the strangest four horsemen that I've seen in a while. And uh, their claims are backed up, but also confused, I think, by the uh, news reports on the television that we see to kind of give a lot of exposition, which I always feel like is very lazy filmmaking to you. It's just, yeah, turn on the news. They'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, and uh, it's, it feels a lot like many Shyamalan movies to me. He is very well, you've probably seen endless. them all. I have, I have not. Yeah. I have not. So, and He's I want to talk a little bit me. about that, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Eric and Andrew think this is uh, some sort of weird suicide cult, and really the movie comes down to, are they going to call the bluff? Mm -hmm. And if calling their bluff, was that going to lead to tragedies outside of the cabin? And one of the things I was surprised by in this movie is there's no gore, really. No. no off screen. It's implied. Right. Which, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. <because laughs> I was glad these, about that. These are some medieval weapons that would be <laughs> yeah. swinging around. I mean, you hear it, yeah. uh, but you don't see it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw this more of a suspense thriller than a horror film. Yes, much more um, tension than anything. I mean, when you said this is one of the movies you have to see, I went, oh, really? Uh, but I, I'll give him credit. I mean, the suspense and the, ten suspense and the tension was ratcheted up mm -hmm. to the nth degree, f at least for me, throughout sure. this entire movie. I agree. Uh, from start to finish. I mean, I don't think I ate any popcorn during it because I yeah. was afraid the chewing was going to distract me from what was going on. Okay. Because I didn't want to miss anything. Yeah. I thought there's going to be a clue or something that I, I don't want to miss. So I was laser focused. So that that's on the plus side. And, and overall, I mean, I thought the acting was pretty good. Now, I'm normally not a big Dave Bautista guy. But I thought he was very effective. Uh, he was really good. Uh, and not only being really creepy and scary, but also in having the audience maybe feel a small amount of empathy. He's the reluctant bad uh, guy, Towards right? his character. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm I get, a school teacher. I don't want to do this. He's good with kids. I mean, you see him in the beginning, you know, he's catching grasshoppers with uh, Wen, yeah. uh, the little girl. So, I mean... Yeah, he's the villain, but he's... He had nuance. You, you, you could feel the turmoil yeah, in his character. There was some empathy going around yeah. there. Now, on the negative side, okay. uh, I, I think I've talked about this before. I do not like it when they have children in peril in movies. Sure. I'm just not a big fan of that. And, uh, you know... We need a spoiler alert real reviews, Jameson, yeah. at some point, because we need one of those episodes where we can talk Just about really this. Get but into it. I was waiting for that trademark, and I haven't seen all his movies, but I was waiting for that trademark M. Night Shyamalan plot twist the at twist the end. The twist that he's known for. And I don't think you get that here. No, I don't think so. I think he wants you to leave the theater asking yourself a bunch of different questions about what happened. You know, who were these four people really? Why was this family chosen? Why did these disasters occur? I, I think it's kind of an open-ended interpretation that you come out of the theater with. I'll tell one. you, this is based on a book. Yeah. And the book. book there's a twist that they, in the book that they a, did not incorporate. And I'm very this. thankful for that. Yes. Um, I, yeah, I, unfortunately, M. Night Shyamalan has kind of painted himself into a corner as a director of being the guy who has a twist at the end of his movies, yeah. like it or not. Uh, he also, he loves putting children in peril in most of his movies. He likes doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I I enjoyed this film. I enjoyed the acting. I thought Rupert Grint as a total psychopath <laughs> was great. Yeah, he was good. Like, okay, I'll take that. M. Night is really hit or miss for me. And, and uh, he carries a lot of, his name carries a lot of baggage for a lot of people. Because he has, I feel like he's burned audiences in the past. Uh, with living by that twist. 
And I felt like he was really concentrated on, like you say, kind of giving you more than just that in this movie. And I, I like that. It's a lot of homages to various things. Like there's a scene when the four of them first get into the cabin and there's a big fist fight. And we get a handheld first person that is straight out of the original Evil Dead movie. And he's always said he, he loves that. And okay. it was like, boy, this looks like it was just shot right out of that. Um, and so a lot of this movie felt predictable to me because he leans heavily into homages of other films and other genres like this. Um, but I found myself, after the movie was done, enjoying it more thinking back and kind of processing it than I did right when it was done. When it was done, I said, eh, it was all right. And then as I kind of started to think about it more, it kind of weighed a little heavily on me. Yeah, I mean... Uh... I thought about it a little bit after it was over, and then I kind of forgot about it. I yeah. mean, it didn't leave a real huge impression on me afterwards. I thought, you know, I'm going to get home, I'm going to have nightmares. No, no. You know, it just it wasn't like that. And I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it afterwards, which I think is the goal that Shyamalan has yeah. in this movie. Yeah, at his best, that's what it does, yeah. I, and again, I'm not a big fan of his. I did like the signs. I, sure. I'm probably one of the few that really liked The Village. Yeah. Uh, I did not like the visit <laughs> at all. No, because no, it wasn't good. <laughs> um, I mean, in the range of his movies from great to awful, of the ones that I've seen, and you can talk better about this than I can, I kind of thought this one fell somewhere in the middle. I agree, actually, and that's what I thought. I was talking to a, a couple of the folks at the palace when this movie got done. They're like, what would you think? I'm like, it's, 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 right, it's yeah. you know, right there. I mean, he has some movies that I absolutely love, Unbreakable, movies like this. It's movies that I really hate, like Lady in the Water and The Visit. Like, yeah, this sits in there. Well, the one thing I really did enjoy was Dave Bautista. I've been enjoying watching him go from well, he's wrestler grown. Yeah. coming in, you know, The Rock's shadow of like, oh, just another wrestler from that same time trying mm -hmm. to become. And I think he's actually really made some interesting choices and hooked up with interesting directors and and making interesting choices like this of playing against his size. You know, he could just play the big hulking guy who comes in and just punches everything. Yeah, but they also do emphasize his size. Well, right. I mean, you get close-ups of his Absolutely. big arms and the tattoos Absolutely. on the tattoos his arms and, and everything. It's scary, but yeah. he plays he plays almost reluctant in that right. in that He's body. The, in the, the gentle giant. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that with him. Um, yeah, Shyamalan, as a, as a filmmaker, I mean... He, He's gone through career hell to the point where, at one point, they couldn't even put his name on the movies. They release his movies, and, they, and his name's not on the poster because that's box office poison. Oh, no, you man. know. And so he's kind of rebounded with Split and the, the movies more recently, right. where they, he's re-celebrated. But um, yeah, I don't know. What did you end up giving Knock at the Cabin? Sir? Uh, you know, I gave it three stars. I mean, I was fully vested in it during. The, the film, but it kept me on the edge of my seat for almost two hours, but then when it was over, it didn't really last with me. Sure. I mean, and I know I'll never hear Boogie Shoes by Casey and the Sunshine <laughs> Man the same again. Sure. Go to the movie and find out why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I originally gave it three stars, and over the week, and kind of processing it, I said, you know what? I'll give it a three and a half. Okay. Yeah. I think that's fair. I'll give it a three and a half stars. Yeah. Just, just today I bumped it up a little bit, but uh, it's enjoyable. And uh, it's the movie that finally knocked Avatar off the top of the box office. It's been sitting there for like 10 weeks. Uh, so uh, if, if you're a Shyamalan, if you have interest in Shyamalan movies, it's one worth checking out. But uh, don't expect that big twist. All right, let's move on to what we have on our streaming spotlight, sir. You watched a movie I wasn't able to. Yeah, yeah, this one's uh, on Netflix, and uh, th while there hasn't been a lot of new streaming choices out there lately, if you're looking for some inspiration, uh, you may want to check out this uh, hidden gem called True Spirit. It's directed by Sarah Spillane, and it's a film based on the true story of Australian teenager Jessica Watson, who at the age of 16 became the youngest pers person ever to sail solo nonstop and unassisted around the world in uh, 2009 and 2010. Uh, it was a journey of 23,000 nautical miles around the globe in eight months, and it's based on a book that she wrote. Now, Jessica is played by Tegan Croft. You may have seen her in the TV series Titans. Uh, she decides as a young child that she wants to sail around the world, and she recruits as her coach uh, the very grumpy and gruff and reluctant uh, veteran sailor Ben Bryant, played by Cliff Curtis, 
an actor you probably seen many, many times he's before. Great. He's great, but you probably can't remember his name. Uh, he's very good in this. But, you know, I mean, he doesn't like people. We've seen this character before. Sure. Uh, Jessica's parents are Roger and Julie Watson. They're played by Josh Lawson and Anna Paquin. Mm. Uh, they cautiously support Jessica while getting hammered by the media for allowing their daughter to do this. Um, so I, 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 most of the movie is the journey. And I thought the film was fairly effective in conveying how difficult this trip was. I mean, you see Jessica maneuvering through storms. Uh, you see what impact those times of no wind had on her when the boat was literally not moving for days. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I've, I've never seen Tegan Croft before, but she did I, a pretty good job portraying all the emotions that Jessica probably went through and you know I, I I thought the effects of her being out in the ocean during you know the storms and everything I'm sure that was all CGI sure. uh, I thought it was fairly effective hmm. I mean there are some musical interludes during this and oh, some yeah? flashbacks to when she was a young child that are on the cheesy side and some of the dialogue gets a little corny but you know, overall, I thought this was a pretty decent, although somewhat conventional, family-friendly movie. And I like movies based on true stories. I had really knew nothing about this, didn't remember any of it from when it happened. And so, uh, you know, it did engage me. I mean, Jessica right now, I mean, she's, I read where she's working as a corporate speaker and a management consultant. Sure. She's currently 29 years old. And she has said that this movie is, quote, scarily accurate to oh, what wow. she experienced on her journey. Uh, and, and, I, and she also filmed a documentary about I was going to say, I saw the yeah. documentary maybe 2015 or so. It came oh, you out. did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I really mean, she, enjoyable. I mean, she took footage. Fil she filmed yeah. herself when she went on this journey. I haven't seen it. Uh, I, d I definitely want to see it uh, to see what you know actually happened. Yeah. But uh, and I, I should have looked up the name of that. I uh, yeah, know. I'm drawing a blank right now. I know I saw it and mm -hmm. covered it years ago, but yeah, that was enjoyable. And it, this looks a lot. Yeah, there's there's just scenes of it that look very much like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is probably one of those Netflix films that is probably going to get lost in the shuffle. Sure. Uh, I, I think if you're looking for a good f film that has to you know, great for the whole family to, to watch. I mean, there's a little bit of peril in it because of her being out at sea, but I think it's worthwhile. Awesome. So. What do you end up giving True Spirit? I, I gave it three stars. Yeah. And, and I want to follow up by watching the documentary. And that's fun if you can have one of those movies that is, you know, the whole family sit down. I know sure. we, we have a few of those in our house that are in heavy rotation. It's like, yeah, we're all we're all good with this. It's, it's not for just the kids I, I think your daughter would really enjoy yeah, this. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well, because she loves the movie Soul Surfer, which is mm -hmm. a similar girl gets her arm, a surfer gets her arm bit yeah, by a shark. Yeah, I remember that. She loves that movie. Uh, this is going to have to be one we have to put on, for sure. Uh, all right, let's take a look ahead at what is coming the weekend of February 17th. We have a couple of films. The first one is... The first big Marvel film of this year. It is Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Sounds like a Def Leppard album. It does. Yeah. It does. Uh, this is the, I mean, supposed to be the big launching point for where we're going with the Marvel Universe, introducing Jonathan Majors as uh, the, one of the big bad villains. And uh, every time I see this trailer, I get real excited for it. Okay. And the music they put under, it, under the trailer is always a good time. Uh, and then we also have, over on Netflix, a film called A Sunday Affair, which is a Nigerian Netflix film about two best friends who fall in love with a man named Sunday, and a love triangle begins because these two best friends are unaware that they're dating the same man. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Cue Mori Povich. Get him in here. Uh, before we move any further, we want to thank our sponsor, The Palace, here in Sun Prairie Marcus Theaters. Thank you for sponsoring this program providing us uh, with some popcorn and a dream lounger to enjoy all these movies. Uh, we do appreciate it. We love going to the palace. Next week, I am going to be talking about such films as Magic Mike's Last Dance. It's hard to believe that it's all coming to an end. Uh, and uh, the new Netflix film starring uh, Reese Witherspoon and Ashton Kutcher called Your Place or Mine. 
But more importantly, Dan Preston and I are going to be talking about our most anticipated movies of 2023 oh. next week. The big list. It's pretty exciting. I'm still trying to narrow mine down, but it's all happening next week, so make sure you tune in for that. Sir, you got anything uh, anything going on here? P- places, you know, if you just if you just watch Kason, you're gonna see this man's face on everything. Way, way talking about too Disney much. movies. Way too much. Talking to important <laughs> people. He's a mover and a shaker. Uh, no, glad to do it. Oh, I'm happy to have you back on this Thank week. Thank you. I always appreciate you. Uh, so until next week, I'm Jameson. And I'm Steve. Thanks for watching.